I'm sorry. All right, so um, haiku number one. I don't think, just act. On my emotions, shit happens. Do I need to change? Number two. I'm at the center of an eternal manhole, flushing to nowhere. Number three. I am happy here. But I keep asking myself, what do I do next? All right, guys. So here's where we need your clapping hands. I'm going to use my patented clapometer. I'm not really going to do that. Um, and <laughs> okay, so round of applause for number one. Do I need to change? <laughs> All right. Round of applause for number two, flushing to nowhere. And round of applause for number three. Oh. All right, I think number three is the winner. Who wrote number three? Who says that? Yeah, lovely, excellent. Thank you so much. Good job, good job. So you can uh, you can talk to anybody and get a free drink, whatever you want, on us. All right, thank you, thank you. All right, guys. So as for the drawings, a dilemma that we've recently faced. Yeah, I really like this one. Yeah, heart versus mind. Number two, dilemma here. This chaos. Seems like it's motorbikes of Hanoi and then taking a flight to leave. I kind of see an airplane back here. So it's maybe it's whether to stay or go. Yeah, fight or flight here. Maybe fighting in Hanoi or flying home. That's really good. Wow. Yeah, cool. All right. And number three. What does that word even mean? Okay. Uh, round of applause for number one, please. Number two. And number three. Number two, I think it is. Who drew the who drew the fight? The fight or flight? It was Caroline. Very nice. Yeah, nice work. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you very much for participating in all this, guys. Thank you. Whoo! Well alrighty, guys. So um once again, unfortunately. We're not going to be able to get through the whole Bhagavad Gita. Um, that could take a whole lifetime. Um, but what we can move into next is going to be, a, uh, we're going to have two sections. One on what Krishna advises to Arjuna about what he calls unattached action. That is, not being attached to the outcome of the action, but being attached to the action in and of itself. Um, and then we're going to have a talk on uh, devotion to Krishna in all things, which is the, the final and kind of over all encompassing sentiment that's given to Arjuna um, by Krishna. Um, and again here, the, the definition of Krishna is not really this, this, uh, this Godhead in the way that we generally perceive gods in God in the West, but as a much more um, ambivalent, all-encompassing, um, everything force, the effervescent energy that exists in all things, from which all things spring. Uh, and then after that, uh, we're actually going to get to practice some Hare Krishna chanting, which I think is going to be really fun. So I hope that you guys stick around for that. We'll do that for maybe uh, maybe 15-ish minutes, you know, maybe get to 108. We'll see. We'll see. All right, guys. So first of all, uh, into the philosophy a little bit. Um, so um, Arjuna is immediately dissatisfied with the answer that was given to him by Krishna. Because um, he, he says, you know, I, I understand that uh, maybe it's, maybe death is actually a delusion. Maybe death is actually a delusion. But I'm looking at the scriptures here. I'm looking at my dharma. I'm looking at the teacher. Uh, I'm looking at the teachings from my family. And it certainly appears to me that I have this responsibility. Um, and if I want to follow these teachings um, to a T, then I have to solve this dilemma. I have to, uh, sorry, the slides are getting a bit mixed. Okay, um, I have to come up with some kind of solution here. Okay, so uh, Krishna then in response, he says, just as a reservoir is of little use when the whole countryside is flooded, scriptures are of little use to the illumined man or woman who sees the Lord everywhere. So he's saying, yeah, maybe scriptural study is really important. Maybe this is good for eventual enlightenment. But actually, it's not nearly as important as the ability to see what's called here, the translation, the Lord, but the ability to see godliness everywhere and in everything. If you can do this, 
you don't need the scriptures at all. Um, we had a talk maybe six or seven weeks ago uh, on the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. I'm not sure if anybody was here for that. Um, but, you know, there's the there's upward dog and downward dog and all of this. There's the breath control work. There's meditation. There's uh, cutting off all of your senses and diving deep inside. There are all of these yogic practices that are taught to eventually bring you close to God. But what's also said in the Yoga Sutras and throughout many different Eastern texts is none of that really matters so long as you devote yourself fully to the Lord. That's a shortcut that you can take. You don't need the scriptures. You don't need the good works. All you need to do is devote yourself fully to the Lord. And we can have a little talk about what is meant here by the Lord. Krishna says, you have the right to work, but never to the fruit of work. This is what's referred to as unattached action. You should never engage in action for the sake of reward, nor should you long for inaction. Perform work in this world, Arj Arjun, as a man established within himself, without selfish attachments, and alike in success and defeat. For yoga is perfect evenness of the mind. Okay, so there's a lot that's thrown in here. So at the very end here, we see this yoga is the perfect evenness of the mind. Um, all of these practices of yoga that we know, the upward dog and the downward dog, um, most of these were invented uh, just about 150 years ago. They're all, they're all extremely new, actually, um, in the history of yoga. Um, these kinds of definitions uh, are, are much more true to the original meaning of the word yoga. Yoga is perfect evenness of the mind. And what he's saying here is that when we're asking these questions, what is right and what is wrong, and when we're deliberating over all of these things, it causes so much chaos in the mind. And Krishna, who is this incarnation of Lord Vishnu, incarnation of the transcendent force that, that persists in all things, he's saying what you need to do to find evenness uh, in your mind is just not ask questions about the outcome of your actions. Stop asking whether or not murder is right or wrong. Stop, th it's just not the right question to be asking, actually. If you're wondering whether or not murder is right or wrong, you're focused on this worldly outcome, which doesn't actually matter, right? What happens in this physical plane, that's not what's important. What's important is your spiritual development, and your spiritual development is reliant on your devotion to the Lord. So Arjuna asked Krishna then, if the fruits of action are, are irrelevant, then why don't we simply renounce the world? Again, why don't I simply go to, uh, out into the woods and, uh, and end all of this struggle? And Krishna says, well, yeah, even if you renounce, this is still a kind of action. The choice of inaction is still making a choice. It's still a kind of action. Complete inaction is actually impossible. And inaction can also cause all sorts of unwanted outcomes. Um, throughout the Bhagavad Gita, the, the actual word as it's translated is this word fruit. Here we use it in English as well. It's like the same in both languages. Um, but, but what it means here is the outcome of the action. So um, we have this term in English, which is sins of omission, which is not acting is the same as doing something bad. If you see uh, a friend who's getting bullied and picked on and you choose not to step in, this is almost morally the same as being the person who's doing the bullying in the first place, right? So uh, Krishna's saying if you're focused on the outcome of the action, even not acting might still have serious outcomes. Another reason why the rightness or wrongness of an action cannot be based on the outcome of the action. Um, any questions about anything that we've covered so far here? Arjuna's uh, or Krishna's points? Okay, cool. Yeah, we're all good so far then. Awesome. Great, yeah, perfect. Okay. Uh, now, it's, it's here where kind of famously, um, Krishna, he makes a distinction between what he calls relinquishment versus renunciation. Uh, now, again, we're dealing with translations here, so it's not going to be perfect. So what Krishna calls relinquishment 
is escaping worldly pleasures, right? Just escaping worldly pleasures is relinquishment. But true renunciation is when you renounce the fruits or the outcomes of your action. That's when you're a true renunciant. And at the time, um, in Hinduism, becoming a renunciant, uh, spiritually becoming a renunciant, is actually considered, a, uh, it's a really high... Um, uh, it's kind of a high place to have. So you're spiritually developed if you're eventually able to make the choice to leave the city and leave the comforts of life and just go out and live in the world, uh, in the woods. Um, so he's saying uh, a true renunciant is one who renounces the outcomes of the actions. And again, if we look purely at the outcome of the action, and if we're debating over this, we're simply asking the wrong question. Now, this is really reminiscent for me of uh, a quote from Wu Li, which is, before enlightenment, chop wood and carry water. After enlightenment, chop wood and carry water. So he's saying that enlightenment doesn't necessarily change the actions whatsoever, but it changes the mindset with which we carry out these actions, much more about the process than it is about the product or the end goal. That we can look at the same action through an enlightened lens, or we can look at, the, at an action through an unenlightened lens, but the, the action itself doesn't necessarily need to change. Any thoughts on this one? I'm just not, I'm seeing a lot of what not to do, but I'm not seeing a lot of like, hey, well, this is how you make choices. Don't do this, don't do this, don't do that, but I don't, you know, where's the other half? Are we getting there? <laughs> we never get there. Uh, so I didn't pay Truett to say that. <laughs> <laughs> But it's a pretty perfect segue. Um, a little bit. We're, yeah, we, we are just about to get there. I have a couple more, couple more slides before that. Yeah, but um, so so maybe I'll just I'll just go ahead to that. So in in just a second. Okay. So um, uh, Bimal Krishna Matilal, who's a modern um, Indian philosopher, he's still alive today. He has this line. He says, "The entire Bharata war, this war that's being fought between uh, these two families, the entire Bharata war was for Arjun." It was his game. And like any game, the value is not in the product. If you were to take, I'll use Truett's example here actually, if you were to take a soccer ball in a soccer game and just place it in the goal before the game begins, you wouldn't say, oh, our objective is, uh, is completed, we don't have to play anymore. Of course not. The value of the game is in the process of playing. The value of this whole war was for the eventual enlightenment of Arjun. Reminiscent of the sand mandalas, ma the sand mandalas that are created by Buddhist monks, where they spend weeks, sometimes months, meticulously placing these individual grains of sand on a board to create these beautiful mandalas. And then as soon as they're finished, they blow the whole thing away. As an affirmation, again, that the value of the process of creation is in the process itself and not in the product. The mandala, the shape, that's not what matters. It was the focus. It was the process of creation that they do this all for. Same thing with our life. You know, maybe we look at ourselves, going back to the fundamental dilemma that Arjun is facing. Maybe we look at ourselves as being comprised of these grains of sand. We can look at ourselves as these mandalas. And when we're eventually blown away and dismembered, it doesn't take away from the fact that there was this experience and there was this process. And that's where the true value lies. Yeah, sure, I, I will say that one. Okay, so um, in addition, Arjuna advises... <coughs> It's better to strive in one's own dharma. That is, it's better to live the life that you were meant to live. It's better to follow your own guide, to follow your own set of rules, than it is to succeed in the dharma of another person. It's much better to be fully who you are and who you are born to be than it is to spend a life pretending to be someone else, filling their shoes. Okay. Um, so now... Just like Truett had actually asked, we get to the answer. So this is actually much later in the Bhagavad Gita, um, but I think I think we're ready for it now. Um, so the eventual answer that Krishna gives is 
devotion to Krishna in all things, and it's not as simple as it might sound right at the face of it. Um, before we go on, though, are there any questions about any of the things we've covered in this little bit? We're good. Okay, great, great, great. Okay, so, um, yes, just like Truett, Arjuna felt really dissatisfied by all of this. He said, okay, you're telling me a lot of, of, of what not to follow. Don't follow the outcome of my actions. Don't pay attention to my dharma. I don't have to follow the scripture. So what do I do? Um, and the answer that Krishna gives is one that I think most Westerners in particular have a very difficult time accepting, uh, one that maybe many people have a difficult time accepting. Um, the answer is devotion to Krishna in all things. So um, for this, we'll, we'll talk about Brahman for just a moment. Now, Brahman, many of these words um, seem to kind of, um, they really overlap <coughs> in their meanings. Uh, Brahman is defined as being the ultimate reality, the final cause of all that exists. Brahman is said to be changeless, but also the cause of all the things that change. It's said to be nirguna. The, the gunas are the qualities of different people or of different actions. That n and Brahman is said to be nirguma, nirguna, abstract and totally featureless um, without any of these qualities. Um, so it said that God, the term God, or when we talk about God or Krishna or whomever, what we're really talking about is a kind of pers personalized Brahman, what's called saguna in Sanskrit. Um, again, Krishna is one, of, is one example of these personalized Brahman. Um, if you're familiar with Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, uh, you might remember the Svadhyaya, um, which implied that there are that deities, every deity, you know, whether it's um, um, whether it's Ganesha, as we'd seen before, um, every deity is actually just an external reflection of our internal self. That it's important that we study these scriptures, that we have the um, that we have the idea of these different gods, because it allows us to actually look back into ourselves to better understand the Atman, the true self, deep within, buried underneath of all of these different layers of delusion. Okay. So this is the idea of Brahman. Um, if you don't understand, that's probably a good thing. Uh, Brahman uh, is maybe meant to be something that can't fit within our minds, right? Okay. Um, in the Yoga Sutras, uh, going back to this again because we, we, we just had a talk on these a few weeks ago, um, it said, by lessening the natural tendency for restlessness and by meditating on the infinite, that line, meditating on the infinite, Posture is mastered. This is one of the only three lines in the entire Yoga Sutras that mention the asana practice, or the physical practice. No upward dog, no downward dog. All it says is that an asana, or a posture, should be comfortable, leisurely, and that it's mastered when you are meditating on the infinite. And this is a similar kind of advice that's given to Arjun in the Bhagavad Gita, that we should be meditating in every action on the infinite. Krishna says, neither gods nor sages know my origin, for I am the source from which the gods and sages come. So he's saying when we're using the word Krishna, what we're talking about is the divine energy from which all of these other gods spring. Whether or not they're real in the way that we talk about the table being real or me being real and you being real, that doesn't really matter. It's a different kind of plane or a different kind of reality. And we're, we're trying to get a definition of what we mean when we're talking about Krishna. He says... I am the source from which all creatures evolve. He's not, um, he's, he, this isn't an arrogant thing. He's not saying, look at how amazing I am. He's saying, understand what it is when you look at me. Understand what it is when we're using the word Krishna. What we're talking about is the source from which all creatures evolve. We don't have a term for this in English, this, um, this force, this energy force that, um, th that, was, uh, that predates the Big Bang. We don't have a word for this in English. But these Indians, these sages, these rishis, they were trying to get at this. They said, th uh, Krishna says, the, the wise remember this and worship me with loving devotion. Their thoughts are all absorbed in me and all their vitality flows to me, teaching one another, talking about me always. They are happy and fulfilled. The happy and fulfilled people are those who keep Krishna, keep this force, keep this energy in their minds always. 
He says, in these two aspects of my nature is the womb of all creation. The birth and dissolution of the cosmos itself take place in me. There is nothing that exists separate from me. He is the culmination of all things, this idea of Krishna. The entire universe is suspended from me as my necklace of jewels, this metaphor that's being used here. Again, don't take any of this too literally, right? Does everybody, is anybody having a hard time getting at what's being talked about here? We're not talking about this, um, uh, this, this human-like God or something that can even fit within a logical framework. What we're trying to talk about here is something that we, we just don't have words to talk about. And we're using these metaphors, we're using these, these pictures, these illusions, to help us understand something that just shouldn't fit within the natural framework of our minds. And one personification of this we can call Krishna. He says, the man who sees me in everything, and everything within me will not be lost to me, nor will I ever be lost to him. He who is rooted in oneness realizes that I am in every being. Wherever he goes, he remains in me. When he sees all being as equal in suffering or in joy because they are like himself, that man has grown perfect in yoga. Okay, so what does this have to do with the fundamental question? Should I kill or should I not be killed? Uh, sorry, should I kill or should I not kill? Um, how, do I, how do I sort out this dilemma what we found, um, I mean, uh, just in, in very recent experiments or studies looking at the practices of meditation, is that when people meditate, they become naturally far more compassionate. They don't need a, uh, a religious structure telling them not to steal, telling them not to kill, telling them not to, not to um, cheat. Instead, they naturally do these things because through the practice of meditation, they naturally want to be more compassionate. They naturally feel more compassion. What's being said here is that when you keep your eye on the infinite, when you keep Krishna, if it's going to be personified, you know, maybe you need this. When you keep your mind on this idea of the infinite, accepting of all things, you're naturally going to feel in your heart the answer. It's an answer that I'm personally very uncomfortable with. I am a person who likes having a rigid structure. Uh, that's who I naturally am. And I, I like having a right answer and a wrong answer. And again, this is, a, this is a kind of answer that I think most Westerners can't really get behind. Uh, it's difficult. There isn't a clear right answer and a clear wrong answer. What's being said here is, by keeping your mind on the infinite, by keeping your mind set on all things, by tapping into who you truly are, your true nature, you'll eventually come to the answer. Any questions? I, 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 it, what I'm saying is not really a question, though. Um, one of the things we, um, I find myself thinking about watching the news is how many people got away with so many crimes for so long. And I look at these people on the TV and they're, they're just like me. They went to college, they came from middle class or upper class families. Why didn't they learn right from wrong? You know, I never went to law school, okay? I only took one law class my whole life on the Constitution. But I've managed to go my whole life without getting in trouble with the police. I never had to get trouble with the IRS. I never had to study law to avoid breaking the law because my parents raised me to be nice to people. So if people can meditate and find compassion, they'll probably be better people than the law requires of us because the law, Amer Laws of a country are usually the low bar of expectation. Uh, I've dated enough lawyers' sons to know that people don't study law because they're good people. <laughs> you did not. <laughs> but you did imply it. All right, that's all I wanted to say. <laughs> Yeah, please. Am I 
question is like looking for an answer that he says like the answer is going to be isn't he also like looking for an outcome in the end uh, you know what i mean like what is, what is the, outcome in the, sense? Uh, the answer like the answer itself is the outcome that you want to reach. So like, you can't really like not look for the outcome when like you're looking for an answer. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's quite confusing, but like, I don't know how to explain it better. Like, it's it's uh, yeah, I, yeah uh, I agree with you. Um, I'm having more trouble with the not focusing on the outcomes of my actions than actually figuring out what to do. Mm, thinking about the infinite and figuring out what to do is uh, seems seems all right to me, but not thinking about what the outcomes are. Uh, what? <laughs> How am I supposed to do that? Look at like what the outcome is. Like, seems like you're not God. Like you live in like a very like real thing. Like whatever action or not action on like whatever like philosophy you embrace, you do it for an outcome. Enlightenment itself is in like an outcome as well. In the end. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I have my own answers to these things, but I actually want to give you guys a chance to talk. Yeah, please. I'm just thinking of it in terms of um, like the greater good versus does an action have a moral value in itself, like standing alone? So, kind of like um, utilitarianism or the ontology, which is like, does my action depend on the outcome for other people, like the greater good? Or does it have a value in itself before that outcome? I'm not quite sure where that value would come from. Um, so yeah, I'm just thinking, I'm wondering if that has a part to play in this part of the story. Yeah. So has, has anyone in here ever had an experience where you made a decision um, but you didn't really have a, a clear understanding of why you made this decision, but you felt like you were just following your heart. Um, and you, you believed that it was going to... Ma maybe could I just see a, a show of hands from people who feel like you've made a decision based on your heart? Okay, how many people in here feel like you have a very difficult time making decisions based on your heart and actually always want a kind of rational rational answer to things, okay. Actually, wow, some of the same hands. Okay, yeah, awesome, yeah, good, good, good. Okay, so um, what I'd like to do then is move into our, our final small group discussion, and then we'll come back and we'll, we'll, we're gonna practice some Hare Krishna chanting, hear a little bit about their history, then also practice some of this chanting. Um, but the, the, um, the question that we have here is, in the face of dilemma, how do you personally decide? A question kind of from earlier that we skipped over. Um, and what does it mean to follow your heart? Um, and maybe maybe an addition here could be something like, in, in, in what scenarios have you chosen to follow your heart um, in the face of rationalism, not thinking about it, the intellectual understanding of the outcome, but instead focusing on what your heart was telling you to do? We'll take about 10 minutes for this one. We'll come back, learn a little bit about the Hare Krishnans, do a little bit of chanting. Thank you, guys.